Good afternoon, everybody. It's that time of the week. It's Friday. Welcome, welcome, one and all. Um, I hope you all had lovely, lovely Easter's. Uh, in London, we were certainly um, very spoiled by the weather, although today, you probably can't see, it is incredibly grey. Um, so do say hello from um, wherever you are. I see we've got Daphne, we've got Beth with us today. Welcome. Um, we've got Jessie with us in the comments. So do say hello uh, to Jessie. Um, so we've got we've got a packed agenda this week. Um, and just just a reminder, uh, our question of the week, which we will come back to you in a bit, is what family stories or rumours have you proved or disproved during the course of your research? So just looking at who's joining us today, we've got Ellen all the way from Rainy Roscoe, Illinois, Cindy, hello there from Texas. Hi there, Debbie, who's watching us on YouTube. Uh, Karen is in a windy Enfield. It's been, it's been so windy uh, in London these last couple of days. It, it was like we were going to have summer, uh, but it, it, it never came. It never came. Um, so, yeah, let, let's get cracking with um, out any further ado. Welcome, everybody. It's um, my favourite part of the week. Um, I get to chat to you all about um, records, newspapers, family history. Uh, what a treat. What a treat. Um, so let's kick off uh, this um, this uh, Friday's live. OK, so our main new record set of the week is the Roman Catholic Diocese of Salford uh, registers. Um, and they are running from 1753 all the way through to 1912. We've also got a lot of new newspapers this week. Uh, more on those later. So just a little background about the Salford uh, registers here and the Diocese of Salford. Uh, it serves the city of Salford, rather unsurprisingly, <laughs> in Greater Manchester, but also um, other Catholic churches uh, in and around Manchester and uh, Lancashire as well. And actually Salford was one of the uh, first post-Reformation um, dioceses uh, which was founded in 1850. So that was when the Pope restored the Catholic uh, hierarchy to Great Britain. Uh, and our Salford records this week, they, they join us, uh, they join our other uh, England Roman Catholic records uh, from the likes of Liverpool, uh, Westminster, Plymouth. So today we're going to be really celebrating our, um, our English Roman Catholic collection. So you see here, we've got a, a lovely map. Uh, now this shows the Archdiocese of Liverpool. So this is the, the entire uh, Archdiocese here. And we've got records for the Diocese of Salford, uh, and Liverpool, and also Middlesbrough. And the um, Salford and Liverpool Diocese, as I said before, were, fil were formed in 1850. And this was really after a very long struggle for Roman Catholic equality in Great Britain. So the Treaty of Union uh, in 1707 dictated that no papist could actually succeed to the throne. And Roman Catholics in Britain really faced uh, widespread discrimination. They, they couldn't practice their faith in some um, in some cases. Uh, and, you know, sort of think, think that era of sort of priest holes, that kind of thing. Uh, it, it, it was a very difficult time. Uh, in the 18th century uh, and, and previously to, to be uh, a Roman Catholic. Um, you couldn't vote, uh, you couldn't sit in Parliament uh, or to have any uh, learned profession at all. But things began to change uh, from the mid 18th century um, onwards. Um, and this was because you had thousands of uh, French Catholic refugees in Britain uh, coming to Britain and then in um, 1829, finally, um, the Roman Catholic Relief Act gave Roman Catholics the right to vote and to um, hold public office. So after this, uh, finally, Roman Catholics could vote. Uh, well, not, every, not every Roman Catholic could vote, of course, at this time. Uh, uh, women couldn't vote still, and you could only vote if you, you qualified, you, you owned land. Uh, and then the Roman Catholic population further swelled uh, in Britain from 1841, and this was from the Irish famine. So in 1841, you had just over 200,000 Roman Catholics in Britain. 
And by 1851, this number had had doubled. It had gone across um, from uh, up to uh, f over 400,000 um, from 1851. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I've, Daphne has um, mentioned that there's a strange noise. I'm really sorry. I I'm not sure what that is. Um, as Jesse said, I've got some rather um, <laughs> annoying neighbours upstairs who like to play their music whenever I come on a Facebook Live. So I'm really sorry about that. So if, if you can bear with me, um, and I will, I am actually going to get a better headset soon. That's arriving next week. So I do apologise uh, for that. Um, if you are hearing any strange noises, uh, apologies. Um, so yeah, as, um, as, I, as, uh, as I was saying, by 1851, the uh, Roman Catholic Brit uh, population of Britain had gone up to about 500,000. Um, and you had some really high profile uh, converts in England, like uh, John Henry Newman. Uh, he was part of the Oxford movement. He was an Anglican. He famously converted to Catholicism. So by um, 1850, the Pope had restored the Catholic hierarchy in Great Britain. So Great Britain had uh, Roman Catholic bishops again, which they hadn't had for hundreds of years, and the likes of the dioceses of Salford, Liverpool, Plymouth, Westminster and Birmingham were all founded. So what do our Salford Roman Catholic registers include? So there are um, three record types uh, in this collection, uh, this particular uh, collection of our uh, section of our Roman Catholic records. Um, there is uh, baptisms, marriages and burials. And this particular collection of the Salford registers, they are transcript only, but the rest of our England Roman Catholic collection does have images. So uh, included uh, in, in your uh, record transcripts, you've got your first name, last name, uh, event date and year, location, uh, that, that includes the diocese, the parish uh, and the county. And uh, you will find mothers and fathers names where appropriate. So I've uh, pulled out this example from our Salford Roman Catholic collection. And what it is, is the baptism of one Joseph Bernard Murphy. Now he was about, uh, born on the 11th of February, 1852, and he was baptized 10 days later. So this is 170 years ago. And he was baptized at St. Patrick's Church on Livesey Street in Collyhurst in Manchester. Now, this is a really uh, important location. Uh, this was the first Catholic church in Manchester, uh, sort of post-Reformation as it was. Um, so it's a really uh, important and historic event uh, for uh, site for uh, young Joseph Bernard's baptism. And you can also see on his record, uh, we've included uh, the mother's first name, mother's last name. So you can see that she was one Mary A. Little. And also you can see there the name of his father. Uh, he was Bernard Murphy. So I was intrigued. So let's have a little look uh, for, for Joseph uh, Bernard's uh, family, see if we can find anything more out about them. So um, lo and behold, um, we managed to find Joseph, uh, Joseph's family in Manchester in the 1861 census. And we can see here that his father, Bernard, he was 62, uh, was a cork manufacturer. And his wife, Mary Ann, he's 54, uh, she was a stay maker. Uh, and both uh, Bernard and Marianne are listed as coming from Ireland. And as is often the case at this time, there's sort of no further information just Ireland. Um, and I think this this kind of reflects that kind of discrimination that uh, the Irish uh, faced during the 19th century and, and of course beyond. Uh, there's nothing, you know, nothing more specific. They just be like, oh, that, that, they're the Irish. Uh, my own um, uh, four times great grandfather, he was a Barnard, not a Bernard. He sometimes would say that he came um, from Liverpool rather than um, Wexford. It, it changes sometimes on his census. So I, I wonder sometimes whether he was just, I can't be bothered with this, this faff of my Irishness and 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 hiding that perhaps. Um, so you see here that uh, Joseph uh, is the son of Irish uh, emigrants. Um, and also he's, he's a young son. Um, Mary's 54, he's nine, so it's, it's, he's, he's very much the youngest here, uh, a late addition um, to the family. 
And now the Murphy family were living at Nine Shude Hill, and that wasn't far at all from St. Patrick's Church in Collyhurst, where uh, Joseph was baptised. And so Bernard and Marianne, they were part of Britain's new Catholic population and their family, of course, uh, having emigrated from Ireland. So these uh, Salford records really trace an important social shift in Britain, uh, a new population and uh, resurrected faith. So we'll move on uh, to talk about the newspapers. <laughs> as, um, as some of you may well know, um, I, I do love my newspapers. Uh, so we um, don't we have a treat for you this week? We've got over, and this isn't this isn't an error. This isn't a typo. We've got over half a million brand new pages for you that this week. I mean, it's just staggering. Of course, we hit that big fifty million uh, uh, la uh, landmark last week, and we're going to continue adding more and more and more and more. So we've got 17 brand new newspaper titles for you this week, and they come from across England, Wales, Scotland and Ireland. And we've got 102 updated newspaper titles in all. And it's always so worth checking out those updated newspaper titles. Um, they are all listed out um, on our, our weekly blog for you to, you to browse through. So if you have um, a local title that you're particularly interested in, and just, just have a look because you know, we are always adding new pages all of the time. And as you can see, we are relentlessly adding new pages at the moment with, with, with half a million um, added. Uh, so some of my uh, personal selections from those 102 updated titles, um, we've updated one of our Welsh language titles. And I really need Ellie here to help me pronounce this. Um, I think it's the Herald Kimrag. I, I butchered that, I'm absolutely sure. But we, we have um, a wonderful array of Welsh language titles on the site. And we've also updated the Yorkshire a Factory Times this week. Um, I mentioned this one when we, we, we spoke uh, a couple of weeks ago about um, professions, and this is a wonderful uh, industry title. And we've got big updates also to the Harrow Observer, the Loughborough Echo, and the Buckinghamshire Examiner. And some more newspaper highlights for you. Uh, and I picked out uh, four uh, special newspapers this week. And these are from our new newspapers. And again, I've, I've tried to spread them out equally. So we've got one from England, Wales, Scotland and Ireland. Uh, and to start them off, we've got the, um, oh, thank you, um, Kim, Come Rag. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. I I will I will practice uh, and make my Welsh try and attempt to make my my Welsh um, pronunciation a bit better. I'm uh, one percent Welsh apparently, according to one of the DNA tests that I've done. <laughs> so for for my for my one percent Welshness. <laughs> um. So yeah. Um. And. Talking of, of Welshness, um, we've got the, the Brecknock Beacon uh, um, added to uh, the newspaper collection this week. And it was founded in the town of Brecon in 1882, full of local news from the town council, the petty sessions uh, and uh, the quarter sessions as well. We've also got the Glasgow Mercantile Advertiser uh, this week as one of our new titles that's full of shipping news from across Scotland, lists of cargoes, lists of ships sailing. So if you have an ancestor involved in um, shipping in Scotland in the 19th century, this is the title for you. I'm uh, going to pop down to London now. We've, we've had a few uh, new London titles this week, uh, but I've picked out in particular the St Pancras Gazette. And this is a really special title because it was actually one of the new newspaper pages in this title was actually our 50 millionth page. So it's a very special title indeed. Um, and it covers the news from northwest London. So that's uh, Camden Town, Kentish Town, that sort of area. And finally, uh, the last newspaper I'd like to highlight today is uh, the Evening News, which is published in Waterford. Uh, and I actually learnt this week that Waterford is Ireland's oldest city. Fun fact there for you. And this title had a particular emphasis on sport and um, racing in particular. OK, um, so that is it for... Um, 
all of our new records of the week. Um, and it's on to our question of the week. And I can see we've, we've had some answers coming through already. So uh, just a refresher on that question. Um, what family stories or rumours have you proved or disproved during the course of um, your research? Uh, so let's just go dive in um, with uh, Sally here. Um, made lots of amazing discoveries, but the best one ever, thanks to the 1921 census, shout out to 1921, um, is my mother's birth mother. We all knew she was adopted and after much searching, I found her name, other ancestors and even living relations who were able to show me a picture. Sadly, my mum is no longer around to look at all the information I have found. I'm sure she would have been very interested. Oh my word, that's that's a, that's a wonderful discovery to be able to be able to do that and to have that information and to have pictures and to connect with with living ancestors uh living relatives that is um really wonderful um thank you for sharing that uh sally um let's see uh who else we've got uh we've got um anya uh two times great grandfather's parentage was questioned when we first started he was brought up by his grandparents uh by his death record thankfully in scotland named his parents cousins on mine still weren't convinced because we couldn't find a marriage Turns out his parents never married. Okay. I found that his mother died when he was a baby of TB and his dad was a witness on a certificate. His dad remarried, but DNA links us to half siblings. Gosh, that's um I I love uh, how you've got the uh, traditional use of records there and then uh, DNA to you to find out um to solve some mysteries there. Um and it, it, you know, we know how difficult it is when you don't have that that marriage. Um, you know, there are so many mysteries. I'm sure that lots of us have where we we have a, a legitimate uh, ancestor. So it is it is wonderful to be able to go back uh, further in time than that. So thank you for sharing that one. Uh, let's see if we've got any uh, other ones coming through. We do, we do. Uh, we've got Janet. Uh, Thank you, Janet. My late father said his cousin Bluff was killed by an aerial torpedo dropped by a Zeppelin in First World War outside the Red Lion pub in Holborn. Eventually found it, his cousin named, was named Henry and was killed by a bomb blast outside the Dolphin pub on the 8th of September 1915 during uh, a Zeppelin raid uh, found, during, found from reports from the London Fire Brigade. Wow, that and that is that is quite a rumour. Uh, and to be able to um, to be able to find out that I mean that that absolute tragedy because I think quite often um, uh, we forget that there were uh, raids, aerial raids uh, during the First World War, and has how how sadly uh, people did lose their lives. Uh, I, I can't imagine how terrifying uh, it, it would be to to see these zeppelins coming over uh i've been doing some research actually coincidentally um into zeppelins and the history of air travel um and, and this they're just there's something quite eerie about them um so a, a remarkable um story there janet thank you um so else um we've got um kim Thank you, Kim. Dad's second great grandfather was rumoured to fix the bars to a jail, and then a few months later was locked up behind them. Oh, and I haven't found out if he attached the bars, but he did have 46 misdemeanours and two jail terms. Wow. <laughs> That's that's quite quite the scandalous ancestor, 46 misdemeanours. Wow. Um uh, and I I I mean I've in my own uh, research, I've I've tried to desperately prove and 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 uh disprove oh i've gone onto my slide i keep that side there didn't notice that um I've, one of the most tantalizing rumors is that um i have spanish ancestors there was this uh rumor in my family that we had uh irish and spanish blood i found the irish haven't found the spanish yet uh so I'm just going to see if we've got any more uh scrolling through um Oh, we've got Karen. Um, question of the week. It was said my husband's great grandfather died of Spanish flu on board a ship sailing from Malaysia to New Zealand to buy a tin treasure. He died in a private sanatorium in Wellington, uh, at New Zealand of Spru, a condition associated with diabetes. Okay. Um, I did a talk actually um 
uh, when was it last month on on the Spanish flu. Um, so I, I can imagine sort of if someone passed away at that time, um, you know, it probably would be associated with that illness. It, you know, it killed millions. Um, so it's so very interesting to know um, uh, how um, he, he sadly passed away. Um, we've got some more, lots more. Um, we've got Beth here. We've got some more scandalous ancestors, I think. Prove the great, great uncle was a naughty one. He was a known pickpocket and also got down for manslaughter. Oh, my word. Um, another great uncle found out more about his boxing career, including that he was one of the last Beth knuckle fighters in Birmingham. Oh, wow. Uh, that, I got some very colourful ancestors there, Beth. Thank you for sharing that with us. Wonderful stuff. Uh, and Linda, we've got, we seem to have um, an, it's another Zeppelin story here. Uh, and another sad, another, another very sad one too. I found exactly what did happen to my great grandfather, my nan's little sister. They were unfortunate victims of the first ever um, air raid by plane over London in 1917. So not a Zeppelin in this case um, and disproved that it, it wasn't a Zeppelin, but but a plane, and um, deeply, very very tragic. Um, it just just that 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 horror of of the beginning of of that kind of warfare uh, targeting civilians. Um, so thank you so much, um, uh, Linda, for for sharing that uh, with us. Uh, and I've I've still got a mission to uh, disprove or prove um, some family stories. Um, I did the one was passed down, and this is it's all in one branch. It's my um, my my mother's granny. Uh, she had all of the stories, and apparently one of our ancestors was awarded the freedom of Dover. Um, we have a Dover connection, but yet to find that out. I I I I don't know. Maybe uh, it's still it's still all to find out. Um, oh, let's have um, one more before um, we uh, we move on. And uh, Sue Moon, um, rumor was that someone saying at the army for having an affair with the boss's wife found out, out found out it was my grandfather before he married my grandmother. The record shows he was thrown out due to misdemeanor, but the man from the archive said they wouldn't specify it as it would embarrass the officer. Gosh, we, we've had some naughty ancestors today, honestly. <laughs> Um, thanks so much, everybody, um, for, for sharing. Um, oh, no, we've got more. We've got more. We're going to, um, Janet, um, it said it was somewhere in the in the family Welsh married Irish. OK, so it's sort of like mine, the Spanish Irish, but my Spanish ones are not real. <laughs> uh, and an ancestor, he used to wear a tall hat um, and proven after, after 30 years. I wonder what that tall hat rumour is. That's quite specific. It'd be wonderful to, to, have, a, to have a picture. Um, amazing. And um, <laughs> Jessie, Jessie's getting involved um, with her, her Georgie ancestry. <laughs> Rumor has it that my answers wrote the Georgie anthem, the Blade and Races. Uh, I, I'm too scared to research because I don't want to find out if it's not true. Oh, come on, Jesse, we've we've got to do this. We've got to find this out. Um, <laughs> oh, and the the tall hat, Janet. Yeah, the tall Welsh hat. That would be it. That would be a traditional dress. Hey, amazing. Um, so uh, let's move on. Uh, we're going to talk about um our browse data sets. Uh, and this might be new, it might might be new to you, might not be. So uh, let's just, yeah, I'm gonna look at the benefits of our browse data sets and what they can add to your research. But what does it mean? What do I mean by when I say browse? Okay, so uh, browse data sets are record sets without an index. Um, so you're not, you won't, you can't search them by name but they are searchable by a date range uh, or a location. So what this is, is, is probably the closest you can get to on our site of going uh, to an archive and flicking through actual registers or documents. So it's, it's a digital surrogate. And it really can be a very interesting way and uh, a really wonderful way of enhancing your research. So you'll notice uh, 
on our site that we have um, a browse collection sitting alongside our indexed collections. So let's take the uh, England Roman Catholic set and we have a, a, a browse set uh, for this. But, but why is this? Well, so having the ability to browse through a particular data set can give you a real sense of place and location um, sim beyond simply your ancestor's record. Um, or, for example, you might be interested in the history of your location itself. So browsing through volumes in this way can give you insights into certain neighbourhoods and the type of people who live there. And what I really like about this, and browse data sets can help you get to grips with the historic documents themselves. Um, like I mentioned before, you have that sense of uh, being in an archive without actually being in one. Um, and we have 230 of these uh, sets to browse. So, you know, from all over the world. So it brings you such a, a wonderful experience and chance to uh, examine these historical documents in, in a bit of a different way than one might usually do. Uh, so you can see here, this is what happens when you click through on our England Roman Catholic Parish Registers browse set. That's a bit of a mouthful. So there are over 2,000 separate registers that you can browse through if you had the time, wouldn't that be lovely, um, that you can browse through in this collection. And they are from um, Southwark, Birmingham, Liverpool, Plymouth, Westminster and Middlesbrough. And you can see here that um, the you, you can see the name of the parish that the register is from uh, and the event type. And we've got some more sort of unusual event types uh, in, in these registers. You've got arms uh, lists, parishioners lists, priests, priest registers. Um, oh, Ellie's here. Everybody say hello to Ellie. <laughs> um, good to see you, Ellie. Hope you're having a lovely holiday. Um, everybody say hello to Ellie in the comments there. Um, so these, what these registers do will give you a fantastic sense of place. And what you and to access them, simply click on um, the little image uh, icon to browse through your chosen register. Now, this is why I love the browse function so much. Um, I, I don't have ancestors who were baptised at the Venetian Embassy Chapel on Suffolk Street, but I just love being able to look at these old volumes. Uh, look at look at how old <laughs> this volume is it's from 1744 it's from our uh, Westminster collection and it's just gorgeous and what it really does is bring home how a document has survived all the way from the 18th century right up to us today and that cover of that book is is worn it's 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 seen some things it's been through been been through some things um but when you open it up Got this lovely writing and I mean I, you can tell it's old but um the it doesn't uh, belie the, the front cover there um so you get like a real sense then of how um these records have been stored how they've survived uh, and you just get that wonderful sense of time and, and and the age of something and when when you're browsing you can uh, dip into the uh, transcripts, uh, if you like. Um, and so this applies to our collections, like the England Roman Catholic uh, collection, which has been indexed as well. And so you can use that uh, film strip option. I love the film strip option um, to uh, view the, the associated transcripts. And this can be really useful when you're uh, struggling to decipher handwriting. And I mean, this, uh, this particular register is written in Latin, I, I went to one Latin lesson when I was at school. I don't know if any of you are proficient in, in that particular language. I would love to be, uh, but I was, I was a poor Latin student. Um, so uh, the transcript feature that can help you uh, interpret the image. Um, but I had mentioned that not all of our um, uh, sets have, have transcripts. So what about these these browse sets that they don't have an index. 
can they be worthwhile to research tools for you? And yes, they absolutely can. Uh, and yeah, so let's have let's have a look at that. Uh, so uh, we have, uh, I think I mentioned before, 230 browse sets uh, on Find My Past. And I've just typed in um, the search term browse to our records A to Z, which again is, is a fantastic feature. And it's given me uh, lots of fascinating results. And these are things, again, that they're quite outside of the box. So they, they're a bit beyond maybe just uh, the vitals, the births, the marriages, the deaths, um, a bit uh, outside of uh, the census records or military records. They're, they're a bit different, these ones. They're, they're a bit unusual. And I came across the Norfolk land tax assessments from 1665 to 1837. And actually, I was like, okay, Let's have a look at this. Let's let's see let's see what we can find. Uh, so, I mean, something when you're looking through this list, something might catch your eye. For example, you might have Norfolk ancestors and think, oh well, I know um, that they were in that that particular area at that particular time. And clicking on them and having a little bit explore, nothing wrong um, with a um, uh, little explore. Okay, uh, so. I delved into uh, the Norfolk land tax assessment, uh, and it's a bit geeky of me, I have to admit. Um, the image on the left is from the window tax return to the parish of Ringland in 1695. So again, we're, we're, we're talking old. Um, we had that Westminster record from uh, 1744. We've gone back now, 1695. So this was at a time when um, a window tax was uh, placed on properties. Uh, we, you know, we thought that we had it at heart today, um, especially in the UK, uh, cost of living, uh, na national insurance going up, but at least we don't have to pay tax on our windows. And I've always been intrigued by the window tax. I, remember, I think it's one of my earliest history memories. I was walking um, up the lane in, in the little hamlet where I grew up with my brother, and there were these bricked up windows on these very old um, properties. Um, and he explained to me about the window tax. So in, in order to avoid the window tax, people would actually brick up their windows. And I mean, it, it later discovered my brother didn't really have an interest in history at all, but um, it, was, it was one of the things that I've, I've remembered. Um, and I was very happy to come across um, this uh, particular window tax uh, return. So I just think it is, and please excuse the pun, it's a wonderful window uh, into the into the past. Uh, and you can see here a list of names, and you can see how many windows these people have. So Henry Jackson, he's got six windows, um, but with 17 windows, and he must have been the local bigwig, is uh, Matthew Mortimer. So this kind of set, it's, it's unusual, it's a bit out of the box, um, but browsing it, it can add uh, a real sense of colour uh, to the past. And then on the, uh, the right hand side, uh, you can see a uh, land tax return from 1813. So this gives the name of the proprietor and the occupier of the property, if different from the proprietor. Uh, we see the Earl of Rosebury, he has five different houses, so it's a local um, landowner. So this, this tax, this, this bureaucracy uh, from the past is, is incredibly illuminating. You can look at their tenants and, and the landlords from 200 years ago and the type of costs that were raised on, on their living. And, and you can even uh, browse censuses, which is probably um, my favourite part of the whole browse experience. So this, this really comes into play for me if I'm interested in a history of the place. Uh, so, for example, the place where I grew up, I, I don't and indeed live now, I don't have any ties to. I grew up in West Sussex, but my my ancestors aren't from West Sussex. They're from all over England. And that don't forget that one percent Welshness. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah. I, I don't have a particular tie to where I grew up, but I'm still very interested in the history of the place. So browsing a census, and it, so I would come to a, uh, a census and I wouldn't know the name of the person in the place. Uh, I wouldn't know who to look for. Um, so I would come 
I will come and I will browse through a census based off of location. Uh, you can browse 1921. I'm just using this one as an example uh, because it would be cost not quite costly to browse every page of 1921. But you can do this for other censuses, so 1911. Uh, but I, I'm just using 1921 because um, it's 1921, and I'm, I'm still I'm so excited that uh, we we have it on the site. And of course, we have the wonderful 50% uh, discount. So if you've not taken advantage of that so far, do it's running till Monday. Uh, tell everyone. Tell your friends. <laughs> Um, so I was trying to find the the place where I grew up uh, in the in the census. Uh, I tried to search Little Bogner. It's it's a very small hamlet uh, in the optional keywords box. I, I didn't find it, so I went to use the next biggest town, which is Petworth, uh, and I got four results for Petworth. And at the front of census books. Um, you will see that they have uh, a description. So you've got the, the rural or urban district at the top, which is Petworth, and then it's got a list of the places uh, that they did this particular book covers. Uh, so this one says um, Eggdean, uh, Fittleworth and Stockham. My particular hamlet that I'm looking for, Little Bogner, is in um, Fittleworth. So this is my book. So I can click onto the book and, and have a browse through. And I was delighted to uh, find the address of where I grew up. And um, one Arthur Collins there was living with his uh, baby daughter. Uh, he was working as a gardener. And funnily enough, when, when I was growing up at that time, there was a family who lived nearby called the Collinses. And this must be my, uh, my next research task to, to find out if this Collins in the 1921 census related to the Collinses who were there um, some, some 70 years later. Um, so it might be worth doing some digging. Again, another pun, maybe. He's a gardener, digging. Okay, yeah, comedy, maybe, maybe not my thing. <laughs> Okay, um, so I just there's some more. Um, actually, there are some more uh, questions of the week coming through um, as I've been talking. Uh, so I'll just bring these up. Um, you can't see my face anymore. There's my face. Uh, we've got Bev. Um, my ancestors were said to come to America to fight with Lafayette during the American Revolution. They actually came. Uh, a, uh, a generation earlier from Germany as French Huguenots. Uh, during the revolution, they were of the Dunkers sex who didn't believe in war, so they didn't fight. Oh, wow, that's that's an incredible story. And, you know, so intertwined with um, big historical events. Um, thanks so much um, for uh, sharing that with us, Bev. And just seeing if any more have come through whilst I've been um, chatting away. Um, let's see. Okay, uh, now uh, let us, I promise more Catholic talk and um, let's continue with our uh, discussion of um, Roman Catholics, uh, our Roman Catholic records in, in England. So I'm going to talk a bit more about our England Roman Catholic collection. Of course, we've added Salford this week. So that um, got me thinking about the rest of our, the locations covered by our growing uh, Roman Catholic collection. And it's also, I'm going to point out as well that we have um, our wonderful um, Scottish Roman Catholic collection. Uh, I think there are several millions of um, records in that collection, uh, and that's exclusive. Um, but today we're going to uh, look at our uh, England Roman Catholic collection. So we've got records at the moment um, and, you know, this is this is a growing collection on the site. So do watch out for um, updates. Uh, so from from across England, really, uh, we've got the north from Middlesbrough uh, all the way down to the southwest in Plymouth. And then we've got London, Southwark, Westminster. We've got the Midlands, we've got Birmingham and, of course, um, Liverpool and Salford. Now, these uh, records comprise uh, baptisms, marriages, burials, but also uh, congregational records. And these would be uh, your, your communion records. These might be your uh, confirmation records as well. And one uh, very special uh, 
uh, element of our England Roman Catholic collection is the one, the lone census that we have. And I, when I was researching this, I must admit I was going to do sort of broad guide to um, the England Roman Catholic collection. But when I was browsing through this particular census, I just fell down the rabbit hole. I'll admit it. And I think we've, we've all been there um, when you're just so sort of captivated uh, by something. So what is this census? Okay, so the census in question is the Westminster Roman Catholic census of 1893. So what this was essentially a census taken by the parish priests, and it was a census of, of their parishioners. So you, you have the usual elements of, of your average census, uh, name, address, age, uh, age only for, for children. So frustratingly, adults is age wasn't included, um, but still, it's still useful to have uh, the children's age and also the occupation. But where this particular census differs uh, from, from usual censuses, from, from contemporary censuses, uh, is the, the religious element. So you'll find tick boxes which show you um, whether the individual attended mass or whether the individual participated in Easter duties or whether the uh, individual had received confirmation. It also showed um, if um, the, the congregation, uh, if the subject of the census, whether if they were married, whether they had received a, a mixed marriage. So that was a, a mixed religious marriage in, in that sense. And then also it would outline whether the children attended a Catholic or a non-Catholic school. And then you had these two further questions as well. Uh, is the child's faith in danger? And is the child in imminent danger of joining the criminal classes? So this census gives a, a, an amazing sense of, of the, the habits uh, of the people included in this census. Um, you know, were they going to church regularly? Were they confirmed? But probably the, the best part of this census, and this was what got me so captivated was the is the part where the parish priest actually gives his opinion of the families that he is um that that he is recording in the census uh so this is this is a free box he could you could write what whatever he wanted and sometimes nothing was written and sometimes Lots of things were written, and sometimes it could be incredibly scathing. You could there was commentary as to whether or not someone was a bad Catholic or a good Catholic, and these comments are are really illuminating and go beyond sort of you know the, the, the usual uh, censuses uh, of the of the time. So let's delve in. Let's delve in. Let's have a look uh, at um, some examples. Uh, so I've uh, picked out this particular page, and this is from the Moorfields area. Uh, so this is this is Westminster, uh, but Moorfields is uh, it's near uh, Shoreditch uh, and, and the city. And at the top there, Mr. Hanlon is noted as a good young man. So that, that's praise indeed, a good young man. And what I find particularly interesting about this is you to get um, a character assessment of of your ancestor is pretty rare. I mean, I, I've seen them in um, Navy documentations. Um, my, my great grandfather uh, was was uh, in the Royal Navy during the First World War, uh, so you, you get the assessments of character, but but not not sort of outside of the military. I haven't sort of seen anything like this, unless of course we're talking about our criminal ancestors, of which. We seem to have rather a few today, uh, but Mr. Hanlon, he's a good young man. And you can see the little ticks and crosses here. Now these are in answer to whether or not someone was going to mass, whether they were participating in their Easter duties, whether or not they were confirmed. And the little uh, CSs there um, stand for Catholic school. So these children, Mr. Hanlon's children were attending Catholic school. And then at the bottom, the second comment there, this is for Mrs. Freeman and her um, family are noted as being fruits of a mixed marriage. So again, you know, you sort of got that 
that sense of, of, of prejudice, maybe from, from the parish priest perspective. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of a bit, it's sort of cryptic. Is it necessary to write that, that they're, they're fruits of, of a, a mixed marriage? So some some interesting remarks. Um, and we've, we've got some more, um, some more very interesting remarks. Um, so again, uh, we're still in Moorfield. It's Clifton Street. Uh, that's actually quite near our old office in uh, Shoreditch. And Mrs. Dodson has has a really interesting annotation here. And it says that she is completely separated from husband. And it'd be quite rare to find this kind of annotation in a comparable document. So the closest thing here would be the 1891 census. And of course, we don't, we don't have that. In, in you know we wouldn't know that Mrs. Dodson was was separated from her husband. I mean she might not be living with him, but completely separated. It's incredibly um, illuminating. And then uh, we go back to the character of uh, our ancestors again with this second example, and uh, Jerome O'Brien here, and he li he's living in um, um, Hammersmith. Uh, he is noted as negligent uh, and this particular parish priest, instead of using uh, those sections to tick or cross whether they're, they're going to mass or not, he's actually uh, put in uh, his own annotations. So Jerome and Brian is only habitually going to mass rather than um, uh, the regular annotation that uh, other people have on this return. So that, yeah, he was negligent with his faith. But meanwhile, his, his near neighbour, Oliver Britton, is noted as a good Catholic. So <laughs> I wonder if there was uh, any resentment between the two or did, uh, did Jerome O'Brien uh, mind or not? So we have um, some more very good, good Catholics here in Hammersmith, in uh, Southerton Row. The uh, Bennett family the, are noted as being very good all. And Thomas Stevens, meanwhile, so he, that's uh, slightly nearer the bottom there of that return. Um, he has a reprieve. He is noted as being formerly negligent, now good. So he's he's reformed. He's um he was once like Jerome O'Brien. He's now become more like Oliver Britton. He has he's he's uh he's reformed his ways. He's now uh going to church a bit more. And he was um attending mass with his wife Eliza and his children John, Thomas, and Harold. And I decided to take a closer look at um Thomas and his family. And I found them in uh, 1901, uh, that's the record at the top, the 1901 census, uh, Thomas G. Stevens, our redeemed Catholic, or reprieved Catholic, uh, he's now a confectioner, and his son John is uh, continuing on his uh, dental career as a dentist's assistant. Um, he was uh, doing, an, uh, I think, an apprenticeship previously in, in the 1893 census. So they went on to 1911, and uh, Thomas describes himself as a police pensioner. He's still working, though. He's a, he's a hall porter. And tantalisingly, his son, John, who was once in the dental profession, is now an actor. I mean, career change. We embrace the career change here. This is, this is um, a turnaround. And again, I was I was finding this like very exciting when there's there's that kind of uh, um, profession noted. Well, I myself I don't have any sort of uh, flamboyant uh, ancestors. I don't have any sort of exciting professions. We're all ag labs, wonderful ag labs, but ag labs all the same. Uh, he is uh, the son. He got his full name in the 1911 census. He's John Edward Stanley Stevens. He's out of work. Difficult to be difficult profession. Um, so I had to explore more. Um, so I just didn't think I got this far without mentioning newspapers again. <laughs> it's me. Um, so where did I go to find out about John the actor? Where else? but the newspapers and our newspaper collection didn't disappoint. And these articles, they are uh, both from uh, 1915 
and it's about a divorce case. Um, so a little bit um, scandalous if um, John was still a practicing Catholic. And the divorce case involved John himself, um, and it was described as being like a drama. So apt for these participants. John was an actor, as was his wife. And John here is described, and uh, this article is from the uh, national newspaper, The Globe. He's described as a variety artist. So we know a bit more about his acting, what kind of acting, what he was involved with. And he was divorcing his wife, also an actress, but she had given up the stage on her marriage because, and I quote, he had cause to complain of her being too fond of admiration and gaiety. So he had remonstrated with her in 1907. So significantly before this uh, article was published and before the divorce uh, was heard by the courts. So she went to live with his her mother and we know that he must have gone to live with his parents too because he's in that 1911 census. So his, his, um, his marriage had broken down sadly. And his wife, and this is, this is the thing, I'm calling her his wife, his wife, in this Globe article, she's not named. She doesn't have a name. She is literally just his wife, not even Mrs. Stevens, not anything, not even Mrs. John Stevens. She's just his wife and as reflective of the attitude to women at that particular time. Um, so she went on to live with a gentleman called Edward Herbert Edwards in Croydon. And it was on this basis that uh, John had asked for a divorce uh, and it, it was uh, uncontested. But then we get this uh, shorter report on the right hand side uh, entitled Variety Artist Divorce Case. So scandalous enough to um, create columns in, in newspapers. I, from my research, I don't think John hit the big time, um, but, he, you know, his his ties with the entertainment world and his divorce made him newsworthy. And we do get to know her name here in this shorter one, which is, is ironic. Her name's Violet. His wife's called Violet. And the, the case was um, undefended and the, the couple were divorced. And I wonder if the parish priest was still around. He was making his annotations back in 1893. I wonder if he was sat reading this newspaper and being like, oh, he, he, he was one of my parishioners or whether he still was and what he might have thought about that and what kind of annotations um, he might have made. So um, I think we, we've come to the uh, end of today's session. Um, I'd like to thank you all so much for joining me. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, as always. Um, I hope you all um, enjoy the weekend. I hope we get wherever you are, you have a bit nice weather. I've just looked out the window and it looks incredibly grey. Um, so I hope um, you all have lovely weekends and yes, don't forget to take advantage of that um, fantastic 1921 offer and um, we'll see you again next Friday. Thanks so much. Take care. Goodbye.